to Two Lit Ladies, the podcast. The Two Lit Ladies, Dr. Katie McKnight and Deanna Gallagher, are literacy experts and educators who specialize in developing reading, writing, and literacy skills for all students. Thank you for tuning in. Hi, this is Katie McKnight and... Deanna Gallagher. And we are the Two Two Lit Lit Ladies. Ladies. (laughs) <laughs> and we have a special guest today for our, our podcast on growth mindset and literacy success. Um, it is my good friend and colleague, and Deanna's as well, Dr. Richard Cash. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Huh? Yeah. And Richard has an extensive background. Uh, he is the author of several books, including most recently, Growth, uh, I'm sorry, self regulation in the classroom. And he's also been a contributing author to some of my books. He's also written, um, gosh, what haven't you written? Oh, Advancing Differentiation, which if you're a middle school, high school teacher, that's a must have for your shelf. And then also uh, differentiated instruction for the gifted learner. Mm -hmm. And Richard has an extensive background, started off his career in education as a first grade teacher. Actually, actually it was middle school. I started off in middle school. Then I went down to first grade. Yeah. Oh, you like. Uh, Yeah, I I went from (laughs) stinky armpits to stinky pants. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> which which just goes to make the generalization exactly that always exactly in a classroom yeah but uh, <laughs> yeah and um i've been fortunate enough to to know richard as a good friend and colleague and he and i have worked in many different school districts together and have presented together and our work is uh, synergetic in the work on growth mindset, self-regulation, and literacy success. And we've had quite a bit of success in several different school districts. And that's really the focus for tonight's podcast. So I'm going to turn it over to Richard. And if you can give us kind of an overview of, you know, uh, self-regulation mm-hmm. and what it is exactly, and uh, then we can start infusing it and what it means sure. for literacy. Sure. Um, self-regulation uh, for learning uh, well. is a tri-dimensional concept of how we view ourselves and ultimately set goals toward, for the learning process. There are the, the three dimensions are affect. How we feel about a learning situation determines the focus of our attention. So if we don't feel good about the learning situation, we're not going to pay attention to it. So we will actually devolve and uh, go into what is called a downshift, where all we're concerning ourselves with is, is survival. Uh, the other state or the other dimension is what is called the behavioral dimension. And that is the behaviors, you know, everything that we do in the classroom, in school, how to play school, how to do all that stuff. It also includes the actually actual literacy strategies of how to read, how to write, how to communicate with others, how to collaborate, all the actions that we do are called the behaviors. The third dimension is the cognitive dimension. And uh, the two, there are actually three dimensions, but two of them are most important to our conversation here today. Uh, One dimension is the metacognition level, which that's just the reflective practice that we do, um, that we should be doing after every lesson or routinely throughout the day in the classroom. Then there's what I've titled as infracognition, and it's an infrastructural thinking. Um, you know, we're all born naturally to be creative, critical, practical, or uh, problem solvers, uh, decision makers. We've all got all of those strategies at a very low survival level. So like how to avoid the saber-toothed tiger and how to find the nuts and berries. Right. Uh, But with the complexities of the world today and especially in the process of reading, which is the most unnatural process for our brain, infracognition is extremely important because kids need to learn which tools to use that are that are well beyond survival. So they're much more complex. The highest level, which you will start to see amongst truly, truly gifted children very early, as early as primary uh, grades. But in most cases, you're going to see it with upper middle schoolers into high school 
especially when we're getting into advanced levels of literature and then into college, is what is called the metaphysical cognition level. That's really the thinking beyond the self. So when when uh, students are reading the Ilis, Ilis, I, I, Iliad, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at the human journey. That's a much more advanced philosophical mm-hmm. concept that little guys would never get because they're just not there metacognitive or they're not there metaphysically. Um, they, they, and so when, when you all will talk about the three, the three legs of, of literacy, you know, the quantitative, qualitative and, and, uh, learner and task commitment, um, this is really where the qualitative side to that comes on that metaphysical, um, the more advanced the literature, the more advanced the student needs to be, um, uh, metaphysically to be able to do that philosophical thinking to to deal with moral conundrums and so forth so that's really the third level we'll we'll spend most of our time in the elementary middle school years at the lower two levels of cognition but ultimately we're trying to move kids into that metaphysical cognition um, level so those are the three and I call them the ABCs of learning affect behavior and cognition and so what we need to do is keep kids focused on the ABCs when you read something, how does that make you feel when you read it? Um, what were the strategies that you used that worked or didn't work? Now, what are your thoughts and reflections on character action, on how do you think this is going to happen? What's your inference? What's your interpretation of it? And so keeping those three in line. The other thing is you also want to be asking kids, how does this make you feel as you get better at reading uh, because what we want to highlight with kids is those students who are the most um, that struggle the most with reading more than likely they don't feel good about reading because they've they've been beat up they've been beat up by the system for many many years mostly boys uh, because they they develop reading slower and usually a little bit later than girls do so we've got to change that mindset that reading is hard. Well, yeah, at the beginning of reading is hard, but once you do it and you practice it and you feel more comfortable with it, confidence breeds success, which breeds confidence. So, um, and self-regulation, yeah, those are the three the self-regulation, Richard. You know, I mean, um, we've talked about it many times and, and Deanna and I have actually spoken about it on our podcast series about that whole affect or affective piece of reading. And this is where choice comes in too. And Deanna and I have spoken quite a bit on on choice and the role of choice and how kids feel about reading because reading is a socio psycholinguistic process. There's real social aspects to that. And then Deanna, you know, with your students too, um, uh, in an IB curriculum and in an international school, you know, how how have you seen you know what Richard talks about as far as you know, how we feel about reading and your students' motivation. Well, what really struck me about you, what you were just saying, Richard, is I was thinking about the way that you define um, these three pillars um, and teaching students that it is not only okay to be self-aware, but it's actually an active, um, an agent-driven kind of way to approach learning. I think about how, especially, again, teaching mostly middle school and adolescents, how self-awareness um, is sometimes seen quite pejoratively, um, that in the sense that we tend to associate someone who's self, uh, maybe we kind of associate with self-consciousness or a sense of awkwardness. I, I think about, um, I don't know, gosh, I mean, this really dates me, but Peanuts cartoon where Linus, where, where Linus becomes aware of his tongue and he can't speak. And he says, he walks around saying, I'm aware of my tongue. I'm aware of my tongue. And that that is that does characterize, I think, so aptly what it is when one becomes paralyzed um, by self, maybe self recognition or recognition of, of discomfort, but without being able to, as you said, like recognize the the ways that you can manipulate behavior, the ways that you can strategize, um, and then when you talked about the higher order kind of metacognitive and really metaphysical ways of thinking about adolescence. Um, what it actually made me think about, Katie, is when we were talking about Sarah Jane Blakemore and talking about the the fundamental the step of, of yeah. podcast episode on the adolescent brain. That's right, little... and that yeah. and that one of the reasons that becomes um, possible at that higher level is because 
self-awareness has then gone on to becoming not just an understanding of the self, but an understanding of a w- identity as who I am in the world. And then mm-hmm. in order to con- consider that, you have to actually understand the world a bit. Um, so all this to me, I just want to hear more of what Richard has to say, but it's making a lot of sense um, to me, uh, just thinking about how I've seen um, effective students of all raw ability world levels, I should say, um, not necessarily just Um, naturally able students. And in fact, sometimes students who have struggled more. I think about students that I've had that are non-native speakers who seem to have these um, kind of strategies in place. And it's actually the the mindful practice that has enabled them to excel. That makes any sense. Well, we saw that firsthand too when you and I taught together. Oh, Uh, For listeners, that was uh, something like 25 years ago (laughs) when Deanna and I taught together on the South Side in Chicago and taught high school together. And you know, we saw that with our students, too, with how they felt about thing, you know, felt about the classroom, felt about their learning and their reading. And we were engaged in, in really linguistically complex texts. And, uh, you know, most of our students, um, uh, I'm sure this is not unfamiliar, you know, the majority of our students were not proficient grade level students, you know, and and, you know, we see that all the time in reading intervention at the middle and high school level, that so much of it is that affective piece, mm-hmm. right? So, um, so Richard, can you go on and tell us about those stages of self-regulation? And and uh, we should probably tell folks at that point how how uh, that all came to be. Well, and actually, I, I, I do want to um, kind of add to this uh, is that every time I'm in a session with Katie as she's doing her instruction, I'm always making these aha jumps of, oh my God, that's right. Oh my God, that connects with this, uh, with this whole idea of self-regulation. Um, let me, let me tell the story first. So, um, Katie, uh, had, we had met, um, at a conference, um, in a bar yeah. over drinks, obviously. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that's just how I roll. Uh, <laughs> right, right, right. And so, um, Katie had, had seen my book before on advancing differentiation. And of course I thought she was a groupie and I had, and I had to say to her, Oh, well, thank you. Like she's, you know, I had one book and was like, Oh, people are recognizing me. And I kind of looked down my nose at her and I said, do you have any books? And she was standing there with a dolly with like four pop boxes of books on it. She said, yeah, I have 13, which, you know, at the time it was only 13. So boy, did I feel stupid right then. But, um, but, but, uh, we, we ended up falling in love with each other and got married that night, um, in the bar, uh, because what, what, when we started talking, because of course, every time we get together, we not only talk about our personal lives, but we also have this great passion for what we do of working with teachers and, and really trying to improve the lives of all children. And so we do, we spent our, our entire evening over a couple of bottles of wine of sharing our philosophies about education and where we come from. And I was in the beginning process of writing this book on self-regulation and it was like lightning bolts going between us of, she said, oh my God, you got to come work with me in Indianapolis uh, at George Washington High School. And I said, well, high school's not really my big wheelhouse, but yeah, I'll come and talk to him about self-regulation. Well, it struck a nerve with with the people in, in George Washington High School because they realized that m- a, a vast majority of their issues that they were dealing with and their struggles with students was because they were dealing with a lack of of self-regulation. The kids did not know how to manage themselves. So uh, it it just was a natural alignment. And we both had to do work back in Chicago. So we took the two and a half hour, three hour drive together back to Chicago and basically mapped out our uh, uh, framework of self-regulation and literacy development. Um, The first stage of self-regulation is what is called modeling and observing. At this point, this is one of the most critical stages because kids have to see people doing things. So as um, Allington says, you know, every kid should listen to a fluent adult read every single day. That's exactly true. So it's not just 
reading a text, but it's also uh, like, how do I read a math problem? How do I read the announcement? How do I read a piece of music? How do I read the instructions for the game we're mm -hmm. going to play? Um, so it's all kinds of processes, uh, different types of text, different types of, of media that, that the kids need to have in that observational toolkit. Mm -hmm. um, and then also with, then they, with writing process yeah. too, you know, that, yes. that we talk about building communities of writers and that kids share their writing as well as a teacher does and, and provide models. So it's not just teacher model, it's also peer modeling too mm -hmm. that we do quite a exactly. bit of in, in writing as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Before yeah. you go any further so, on that uh, one, let me ask you, yeah, um, yeah. sometimes teachers believe that it's, it's only appropriate to call upon positive, extremely positive or role models for that modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your position on that? <laughs> Well, um, I, I've got a couple of different positions on it because I've seen it done very poorly um, where they um, are punitive in, in the way that they will call out someone doing it incorrectly. Um, that only damages the self-esteem of the child, uh, their, their belief about themselves, and then it also damages their self-efficacy. So they're also saying, I can't do this now because this teacher has determined that I can't do that. Um, there are ways to do it in the most positive light where if a child does something incorrectly, reads the flow incorrectly, like I always go back to the old Lily Tomlin uh, skit that she did as she was uh, uh, Edith Ann and <laughs> <laughs> they were doing they were doing round robin reading in oh my God. the classroom <laughs> And Edith, Edith Ann uh, counted <laughs> how many paragraphs before she was about to read. And she she was so proud because she had read the, 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 the paragraph over and over and over before it got to her. And then she stands up and she says, there was water all around the Island. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, then she says and all the students turned to her and laughed and laughed and laughed and from then on she was known as Island, Island, Island. yeah so I, oh my gosh we gotta find that yes. that that um video you, yeah. and use it when we rant about round robin right. reading yeah, it's, it's, you know? it, yeah it's a lily tomlin uh thing i'll, I'll find it on, on youtube but um, so, so there are, there are positive ways we can reinforce that where the teacher could say, let me, let me read it for you and see if you see the difference, if you hear the difference in the two ways, um, mm -hmm. not that the child is wrong, but just that the inflection might be in the wrong place and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they need to know that the teacher is there to support them and not yeah. there to belittle them. And, and, and like I said, affect is probably, I think the first of the three, uh, because again, how you feel about a situation determines the focus of your attention. So if that teacher just demeaned you, your attention is now purely mm -hmm. on being belittled. And so you're now afraid mm -hmm. and you're into fight or flight, um, well, and I think that's really interesting because uh, as as you just described, I've seen that on many occasions that there's modeling and observing going on of it's it's not a one to one um, interaction in, right. in that situation. Other students are watching and are observing how the student responds, how the teacher responds, the dynamic in between, making their own judgments, sometimes actually more impacted by the witness oh, of someone sure. else's humiliation than, right. than they would be right. on their own. Um, and I do that yet at the same time, I have been in that situation where I've been thinking, OK, well, how do I make it possible for this student to participate without potentially putting sure, him or her sure. in a humiliating situation because of that? So it's, it's interesting to hear you. I think what you have pointed out is that it's really important to know your students and to know what they're, you know, to put, to be sensitive to what their, what their effective kind of, um, their, their effective predisposition may be Absolutely. depending upon the and, context of the situation. And, I mean, Katie yeah. and I and you uh, are, are extroverts. Uh, we like to think out loud and realize that many of our students that are mm. probably the strugglers are probably introverts. And especially if you're dealing with EL mm. students, um, they're going to be mm. much more introverted because they're not comfortable mm. with their level of, of language acquisition. And so 
to demean a child um, out loud, uh, it, it, it just, it'll stifle them. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, that goes back to, I'm not going to call on okay. a student who I don't think is going to be comfortable with being able to speak out loud in front of other, other readers. And there again, it goes back to the fluency. Um, mm-hmm. We've, Katie and I have been in many a classroom, and I'm sure you've seen this too, uh, where they do that round robin reading and it's non-fluent readers. And so it's a room full of non-fluent readers and they're just going backwards. Mm, <laughs> they're yes. not going forward. It's, it's, it's very painful, actually. It's, it's painful. Um, especially because the kids are sort of waiting for someone. To start. They're like, right. stop right. this train. Stop yeah. this train. <laughs> stop the madness. <laughs> <laughs> Then there's copy and do, and copy and do. Um, I, I, I again go back to my my time as a, a first grade teacher, and especially uh, uh, teaching reading or teaching anything really. Um, parents used to tell me all the time how much they hated me mm-hmm. uh, because um, not that they hated me instructionally, but they hated hearing when the kid would go home at night <laughs> and the parent would try and help them with their homework and the kid would turn to their parents and say, no, that's not the way Mr. Cash does it. Because, you know, first graders, kindergartners are very much in reverence of that copy and do <laughs> I have to do it exactly the way you showed it to me. You know, think think about the first time you ever uh, m- m- made something off of a recipe card. Um, you you did it exactly the way the recipe said, because that's the copy and do. The more you do that, you build that acuity of being able to be flexible and, and know what looks right and know what tastes right. And, and so you can then move into stage three, which is the practice and refinement. Um, I think the copy and do stage um, it can is very much a transitional stage. Um, you don't want kids staying there too long because they, I, in my belief, is they can get caught, and they're gonna they're gonna wait for you to tell them exactly what to do, and they're not gonna learn how to be independent and then take take those risks. So, mm. Okay, so that if you don't, if you take it too far with sort of trying to achieve some sort of exact perfection, you're really actually going to decrease the agency that you're trying to get this. Exactly. That's that's a very smart way to say it. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, kids kids can't stay there too long because again they lose their confidence because they're doing it exactly the way it's been prescribed to them. This is why I have problems with like the accelerated reader because it doesn't get them out of copy and do it keeps them stuck in copy and do because it's at a very low level. Um, any of those, those uh, basal programs that are, you know, basically follow it exactly the way I tell you to follow it. A lot of the prescriptive uh, teacher methodologies that are, you know, everybody's going to be on the same page on the same day. Um, that worries me because I think stuck in the copy and do. Um, so then, then the, the third stage then is what is called practice and refinement and practice and refinement is really where the kids learn, uh, they're now taking those intellectual risks. They're now trying things differently. They're not afraid to make a mistake. See, in Mm. copy copy and do, there's mistake making. They don't want to make a mistake because it's got to be just the way it was with with the, the rest of the class. Now at practice and refinement, you're actually at a place where you can make mistakes and it's actually good to make mistakes because you learn what not to do next time. Yes, um, yes. Then, um, and in practice and refinement, what you start seeing, I think more, what, what you start seeing in the literacy side is you start seeing kids challenging themselves by choosing a higher level piece of material, uh, choosing to read something in a different genre or reading for informational text versus reading mm-hmm. always nonfiction um, or, I mean, uh, fic- mm-hmm. yeah, fiction. Um, I get, always get those two mixed up. Uh, but Because now you call it <laughs> informational text rather than nonfiction. Uh, but, but That's read- right. 
you messed me up. Uh, but, the, but <laughs> you start seeing kids being able to yeah, transition yeah. <laughs> then from where they were taught in the reading, which usually is fiction, and they're able to transition that over into nonfiction. That's really the critical stage for that piece because that's the practice and refinement. The the final stage then is independence and effort. Oh, before you go to before you leave stage three, um, I wanted to ask, yeah, because I think that you brought the. I'd love you to say um, a bit more about you. You talked about risk taking and that practice and refinement being the place where students are starting to. I uh, to take risks to maybe choose something to put something on their intellectual plate that they've never tasted before um, and to find out they do or don't like it. And again, that comes back to that um, to that effective place, which is much less reactive. Um, you in the very beginning, you were talking about you use some great, um, you know, I, I'm such a big fan of evolutionary psychology and its applications to what happens in the classroom. And I, you know, you start to talk about um think about students as actually, you know, back to those nuts and berries or different things that we're sampling. Well, you know, I've got a full tummy and I'm reasonably secure. Um, I might see that I, I, there isn't a, as great a risk involved in failure. Um, and there isn't, and in fact, there's the, the reward outweighs the risk, essentially. Um, what, what is critical at the practice and refinement stage is that I can fall back on a strategy. And, um, you know, the, you know the difference between a strategy and a skill. A strategy is a dis discrete conscious right. action. And a skill is where you've amassed enough of those strategies that you can unpack it down to the individual strategies. In copy and do, they're using strategies. Mm -hmm. In practice and refinement, they're moving from strategy to skill. And so here is where they've got to be very clear about the strategy to then be able to fall back on a strategy and say, mm. here's what I need to do when I encounter a word I don't know, or here's what I do when I encounter a, a pattern in the literature. So when I, you mm. know, go from reading Ibsen to mm. uh, Shakespeare, two different patterns of reading. And so mm. I need to have the strategies to slow down back up when I don't mm. understand a word, you know, and all that, that, that stuff. So the practice and refinement is really critical for mm -hmm. teachers to be there ready to support the child with, okay, let's unpack mm. that. What did you do last time? You know, go back into the ABCs. Mm -hmm. Now you're, I'm sure you're feeling stressed right now. That's okay. That's a good mm -hmm. place to be because mm -hmm. that frustration tells you that something's not right. Mm -hmm. Now, what should we do? What did you do last time that worked or didn't work? And then, okay, what's the plan for the next time? What do you think you should do the next time this happens? So it's always going back to the ABCs. That, that, that to me is critical. When we jump over the mm. affect and we don't point that out to mm. the learner, that it's okay to be f frustrated mm. because that frustration tells you something's wrong. And that, could, that circles back to self-regulation. Exactly. So what do you yeah. think mm. you should do? Exactly. 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 Right. So then, uh, so then we move from practice and refinement, ultimately where we want to go to independence and application. Mm -hmm. And that's truly at the skilled level where kids now don't need to rely on the teacher to tell them what mm -hmm. to do. They can do it on their own. Teacher moves from a place of um, didactic instruction, you know, I'm going to tell you what mm -hmm. to do, up to more of a consultant at this point. So it's a really a consultative level of instruction when kids get mm -hmm. to independence and application. Now, you might have recognized as I was going through mm -hmm. these stages, modeling, observing, copy, and do practice and refine the independence and application. Mm -hmm. hmm, that kind of sounds familiar. It's the I do, you, right. we do, you do, voodoo, <laughs> as Katie says. It's the gradual, it's mm -hmm. the gradual release of responsibility. The, G, the GRR came mm. out of studies on self-regulation. Mm. That's where it came from. So these are the developmental processes that kids go through. And, and as we say with... Exactly. Happening, we mustn't. It mm -hmm. will happen over time. 
And it mm-hmm. happens at every age. Even I, as an adult, still mm-hmm. go through the four stages. Um, you know, I was recently in Korea and I walked out of a uh, baggage claim and I stood there for about 30 seconds <laughs> and just watched people go by because I didn't know what mm-hmm. side of the hall to walk on because I'd just come in from Indonesia where they all walk <laughs> on the left side of the hall. And in Korea, they walk on the right side of the hall. So you don't want to be running into people. So, uh, you know, you go through these processes mm, as adults Absolutely. As well. And then <laughs> I don't know that I've ever actually been able to achieve gradual release of responsibility <laughs> at any airport <laughs> at any time. So I'm just impressed with that. There's, there's right. a 12-step <laughs> for the four stages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking right. about, I have, I want to travel with this guy because let me tell you I can't <laughs> I can't figure what side of the road to walk on in my native country but anyway. yeah, but you know but you know which side to drive on though <laughs> this is true you That's got your true. riding forward in, uh, in, uh, in England yeah yeah okay. so um so I want to thank our listeners uh for joining us uh for yeah. this podcast and Richard, thanks so much for, for joining us as, as a guest on our podcast. Thank you. Absolutely. It was really wonderful to, to listen to you and to, oh, to feel that sense of connection. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and, you know, thank you for all the work you guys do, too, because, um, you know, it's, it's really important that uh, we develop a literate population. <laughs> yeah, I can. Um, you know, <laughs> especially, especially in today's yes. world where, you know, we, we get bombarded with so much information and how to unpack all that information to find out, um, you know, th- truth isn't truth. Uh, but to, to, but to be able to find out wh- where is the truth, yes, um, and how do we truly disaggregate this information and analyze and 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 really be a thoughtful population? Because I I, I always kind of my motto uh, when I teach teachers, my motto is our job is to teach kids how to think, not what to think. Yes, that, and you know what you just, you just said that. When you described that, I thought to myself, okay, you've got your first stage, second stage, third mm-hmm. stage, fourth stage. The fifth stage that you're really talking about there is discernment. Yeah. And, yes. Yes. and yes. that is perhaps the subject of a future podcast. Who oh, knows? That's, um, a, that's a really good one. I like that one. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so thanks again, listeners, for joining us on our podcast, Growth Mindset and Literacy Success, with our special guest. Richard Cash, and I'm Katie McKnight with Deanna Gallagher. And we are the two lit ladies. One of these. You gotta get, get that we gotta get that down. We gotta do it. <laughs> okay. Thanks again. Okay. All right.